We're going to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Well, we're going to talk about the power aspect of the Holy Spirit because, you see, the Holy Spirit is the power source. We need to know that. Let's get right into the Scripture. Go with me to Matthew, the third chapter. And I want us to begin reading with verse 11. This is John the Baptist speaking. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into his garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus to Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. Now I want you to notice here that John the Baptist is preaching before Jesus is ever revealed. He is preaching that there is coming one that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now you realize that that's talking about a different baptism than what John is baptizing them with. When Jesus comes to John and says he wanted to be baptized, then John says in verse 14, I have need to be baptized of thee. So you realize right away we're talking about two different baptisms. One is the baptism of repentance, which John was preaching, but this is the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Now, let's read verse 11 again. John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than thy, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you. Notice, he shall baptize you. Who? He's talking about Jesus. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, I realize that many of you, you're sitting here listening to this, and you're thinking, yes, but you see, I don't believe in that kind of baptism. Well, now, you're either going to have to believe the Bible or not believe the Bible. Here it is. He said, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, he's talking about Jesus baptizing you with the Holy Ghost. In other words, it's a baptism of Jesus and the Holy Ghost. Jesus wants to baptize you in the Holy Ghost, not in water, but in the Holy Ghost. Now, see, it is scriptural to be baptized in water. I understand that. But this is what I want to bring out to you, that John was already preaching this, that he is coming to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Let's go right on over now to Acts, the first chapter. We find that Jesus is about to ascend to the Father. And let's begin with verse 4, Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Now, this is Jesus speaking. He says, But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now, I realize there's some of you that are listening to this thinking, well, now, he's going to get off on something that I don't believe. I realize there's many of you that have been taught in your churches. You've been taught by men that this baptism of the Holy Ghost with the speaking of other tongues is of the devil. Well, now, wait a minute. Let's just go through a scriptural journey through the Bible, through the New Testament, and find out if it's truly of God or if it is of the devil. You see, don't turn your head off to it because, you see, if you've been taught wrong, then you need to know the truth. Now, if I'm wrong, you need to know where I'm wrong. So just stay with us in this, and let's go a scriptural journey through the Bible. See, that's all we have to go by is just the Bible. No, I don't ask you to believe what I say if it doesn't agree with the Bible. Now, I realize that men teach things that are wrong sometimes. Now, that doesn't mean that the man's wrong, and I'm not trying to turn you against your pastor or against some denomination. Bless their hearts, I'll tell you, there's men of God out preaching against the Holy Ghost that it's not of God and that, well, they believe in the Holy Ghost, all right, but they don't believe in the tongues part. Well, now, you know, that's like saying I believe in elephants, but I don't believe in trunks on an elephant. 
Well, I mean, the trunk comes with the elephant. I mean, you got a funny-looking elephant. Somebody said, well, could you have the Holy Ghost without the tongues? Well, I guess you could. I mean, it might be possible. I can't find it in the Bible, but it might be. But it'd be kind of like having an elephant without the trunk. I mean, you're going to have a funny-looking elephant. <laughs> so, well, now, stay with me in this, because, you see, there's some people, there's some men, I mean some good men, Christian men, born of the Spirit of God. Their heart's right with God, but they're wrong in their head. They've been taught wrong. Now, you realize if you've been taught wrong, and if they've been taught wrong in seminary, they go to the seminary and they teach them that tongues is of the devil and baptism of the Holy Ghost is not for people today. Why, well, certainly they're going to be teaching that because, see, that's all they've been taught. That's all they know. Well, stay with us in this and see some things. There's some that are listening to this. Some of you pastors need to get a hold of this. Some of you have turned it off every time it's come forth. And I realize that some of you have heard people that just come out so dogmatic about it till it just turns you off. But I want to share with you in love what the Spirit of God is trying to get over to you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not some occult. It's not something that's just for people that are ignorant. No, thank God. This is the power that you've been searching for in your life. I'm speaking to a minister now that you've come to the end of your rope. You don't know what to do. You've tried everything that they've taught you to do, and you haven't been able to get it together. You're about ready to quit the ministry and go off into another area of business, and the Spirit of God is saying to you, now, don't do it. Don't do it. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what you've been searching for all of these years. You've sought it in other means, but thus saith the Lord God Almighty, seek my word and hear what the word has to say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the light of it, and you will rise to a new level of understanding, and the things that have been confusion in the days past will cease to be confusion in the days to come and you'll walk in the revelation knowledge of my word. You'll be filled with the power of the Spirit, and the anointing of God will come upon you. Your ministry has just begun, saith the Lord. Don't turn it aside. I'm teaching you. I'm leading you. Walk in the light of it, and I will reveal myself in you, and my Spirit will come upon you in mighty power, and you will walk with me in the power of the Spirit, and all the power, and all the anointing, and all the results you've desired desired to see in the days past will come to pass when you yield to my spirit and walk with me in the power of the Holy Spirit, saith the Lord. Oh, glory to God. Well, I don't know who that's for, but I'll guarantee you, whoever it's for, you will know it instantly. You knew it when it came forth. It's the Spirit of God talking to you, and I'll tell you, God wants to bless you and fill you with the Holy Ghost and power. But the Holy Ghost and and fire. You've been looking for the fire. I'll tell you, brother, you've found the fire. Now, I'll tell you, God's talking to some of you out there. Praise the name of the Lord. Well, the Holy Spirit can just speak any time he gets ready, because I'll tell you, God is going to do something in your life. All right, let's find out now. See, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit in light of the Bible, what Jesus said about it, what the Holy Spirit of God is trying to get over to some people today. Now, there's a many of denominational people listening to me, and I know you've been taught it's not of God, but stay with us now and see what God's Word says about it, because some of you in the same position, you've been wondering, well, I thought there was more to this than what I've been getting. Yes, there is, thank God, and you can get it if you just stay hold of it. All right, let's go on down now. I want us to look at verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the time of the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Notice 
the first part of the verse, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's the reason some of you have not walked in the power of the Spirit, and you have been so uneasy in your spirit, is because you know there's something more to it, and you've been taught in religious circles that it's not of God, and you can't have it for today, but the Spirit of God is saying to you, it is for the day, you can have it today, it's available to you, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I want you to know that you receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. No, it doesn't mean just because you're filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized in the Holy Ghost that you automatically have all the power that he's talking about here. Now, let's take this verse, for instance. It says, you shall receive power. The word power is the same word. The Greek word translated power there is the same word that we get our word dynamo from. I started to say dunamis. That is the word dunamis, which is the same Greek word that we get our word dynamo from. So in other words, he said, you shall receive a dynamo or dynamite. It's the same word, I believe, that we get our word dynamite from. You shall receive dunamis. In other words, the dynamo that produces the power. It's a self-energizing force. Well, you will receive that dynamo after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But I want you to realize something, that the Holy Spirit comes to you, and Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to us so we would receive power. Now, there's many of you thinking, well, I just don't have any power in my life. I don't understand it. Well, get a hold of the Word here, and you'll find out why. There are many religious people today, many people born of the Spirit of God. Oh, yes, they're on their way to heaven. You can be saved without receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I know there's a lot of people teach you can't, but I mean you'd be taken away from the blood of Jesus if you said you couldn't. You need to know that. But I want you to realize there's something more here that some of you have been missing. Now, let's go on with this. It says in verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, and received him out of their sight. And while they were looking steadfast toward heaven, and he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, you see, I think sometimes what we've done, we've kind of done that. I've seen people that stood around, and they're just waiting for Jesus to come back. They're standing around. You've got heaven gazers, people that are just waiting for Jesus to come back. You know, they're watching for any minute for Jesus to return. Well, I want you to realize that there's some things that we need to do today before Jesus comes back. We need to get Satan under our feet. We need to get a hold of God's word and begin to use the power that he gave us to bring Jesus back. Then it says in verse 12, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had come in, they went up into an upper room. Now, you see, here's where Peter and James and John and Andrew and the others were there. They went into the upper room. Now, I want you to realize that Jesus has said something here to these disciples. He said for them to stay there. In other words, go there into the upper room and wait or tarry in Jerusalem. Wait there until the Holy Ghost shall come. In other words, don't leave until the Holy Ghost comes. Then back up to verse 4, let's read it. Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Wait for the promise. What? The promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, here are the disciples. I want you to get this picture. This will help you. They are saved. These people are, at least they're righteous. They're following after Jesus in all the life that they have. But they were commanded to go and to wait until the Holy Ghost came. In other words, don't go out and start preaching until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, you ought to get a hold of that because there's something there. Jesus knew they were going to need the power. They were going to need this self-energizing dynamo that he was going to send. He said, I'll send him to you. He'll come to you. He'll abide with you, but shall be in you. Talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to realize that Jesus speaking in John chapter 14, verse 12, he says, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. Now, what did him going to the Father have to do with you or me doing the greater works? Because he said, if I go not to the Father, the Holy Ghost will not come. But if I go away, I'll send him, I'll send the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, and he will abide with you forever. In other words, when I send him, he said, he'll come and dwell in the midst of you. He dwelleth with you, but he shall be in you. Now, you see, under the old covenant, under the old law, only the prophet, the priest, and the king had the Spirit of God. They had the Spirit of God. But you see, the average ordinary layman or ordinary individual did not have the Spirit of God. But today it's available to you. That's why he said for them to go and tarry there until he came. Now, to realize and to understand how to receive the Holy Spirit and what the evidence is, let's go on into chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Now, I want you to notice something before we get into that. Sometimes people think, well, we're going to have to tarry because Jesus said, tarry ye in Jerusalem. No, no, you don't have to tarry today or just continually wait before the Lord on the Holy Spirit. You see, they were waiting for the day of Pentecost to come. That's why they were to wait in Jerusalem. They were waiting for the day of Pentecost. We don't have to wait for the day of Pentecost today because the day of Pentecost has already come. The Holy Ghost is already given. He's already here in the earth. He is working today in the earth, and he's not lost. You don't have to seek him for seven, eight, ten, or twenty years. He's available to you. I want you to realize that when they went into that upper room, they were in one accord there. In fact, I want us to read verse 14 of chapter 1 before we get into chapter 2. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. I want you to notice that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there in the upper room. Now get a hold of this. She was in that 120. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, then the number of them together were about 120. Now notice, about 120 of them in that upper room. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. Some of you need to get a hold of this because I know that some of you didn't realize that the mother of Jesus was in that group that was there on the day of Pentecost. Now let's go to chapter 2, verse 1, and read it again. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, in other words, had the same mind, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I want you to notice they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. No, it didn't say just part of them were. didn't say just a certain percentage of them. Now, I heard of men that said on television one time, he said there's nowhere in the Bible where that anyone ever spoke with tongues except the twelve apostles. Well, you know, that man needs to learn to read. Because, you see, there were 120 in this place. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and set upon each of them, and they were all filled. See, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I want you to realize that it was the Holy Ghost that gave them the utterance. But they spoke. They who? They the people. In other words, they had to speak it. The Holy Ghost didn't just take over. The Holy Ghost didn't take their tongue. The Holy Ghost didn't just make them receive something they didn't want. No. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
Now, as they were assembled there, they came a sound as a rushing mighty wind filled all the house. Now, you see, the Spirit, Spirit of God, Spirit means wind, breath, or air. Now, let me call to your remembrance when Jesus appeared to his disciples, and he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. The breath that he breathed upon them was symbolic of the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of truth that they were to receive. Now, here on the day of Pentecost, it came to pass. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, when it was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because they heard Every man heard them speak in their own language, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to the other, Behold, are not all of these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in his own tongue, wherein we were born? Now, you see, they heard because they were speaking in their language. Now, some have said, well, you know, that was a miracle of hearing. No, no, it was not a miracle of hearing. It was a miracle of speaking in tongues. They spoke in the language. They heard them in the language because they were speaking the different languages, and they had not learned those languages. See, this is the miracle of tongues. This is a miracle that comes through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that a man does speak in a language that he has not learned. Now, you see, sometimes people say, well, how in the world could anybody speak? I don't understand that. I just don't believe in that. Well, if you've been taught that way, you wouldn't believe in it. I can understand that. But just stay with us because we're going to show you where it's scriptural. We're going to show you how you can enter into it, and many of you are going to be filled with the Spirit, and you're going to speak with tongues because it is a Bible experience. It's a valid experience. It's available to you today. And they went on down, and they said, these men must be drunk with new wine. But no, they were not drunk with wine. They were drunk on the Spirit of God. I mean, filled with the Spirit of God. Well, you see, the Bible said, ye shall receive. Jesus said, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Well, the power comes after the Holy Ghost has come, and we're going to find out how to get that anointing and that power upon you. See, the anointing comes with the Holy Ghost, but you can operate in a spiritual power. It's available to every one of you that receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want us to look in verse 12 and a few verses down. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be it known unto you and hearken unto my words. Now, I want you to get this picture. Here's Peter. Here's a man that always getting in trouble, always saying something he couldn't back up before he was filled with the Spirit of God. But you see a completely different man now. If you want to know what good the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you today and what is the benefit of it, well, just go back and study the life of Peter. Just take him for an example and look at the life of Peter before he was baptized in the Holy Ghost, before he was filled with the Spirit. Everything he did, he got in trouble. I mean, he went fishing, fished on the wrong side of the boat, run a race to the tomb, lost that. He's always saying, I'll die for you, but he ended up denying Jesus. Well, I want you to know there's a completely different man came out of the upper room because the Bible says ye shall receive power. Jesus told them, said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And some of you listening to this right now, as you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speak with other tongues, it will make a tremendous change in your life. Now, I'm not telling you it's going to happen just because you spoke with tongues. No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about as you receive the power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You need to know that the power is coming when you're filled with the Spirit of God and begin to be obedient to the things of God. So you see Peter here. Here's a man that is a great example of this. He's filled with the Spirit of God. He spoke with other tongues in the upper room, and he became a changed individual. 
not only here, but as you go on and study his life after this, you see a completely different individual. As some of you thinking right now, well, I sure like to be a completely different individual. I know there's something more to this than what I'm getting. Well, you're right. There is more to it than what you've been getting because you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you if you're obedient to what God's Word says to do. Now, notice that they're accusing him of being drunken with new wine. And Peter says, no, nah. he said, these are not drunken. Verse 15, he said, these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In other words, he said, you're seeing prophecy fulfilled right before your eyes. And I want you to realize that Peter was not just making up scriptures here. He's sharing some things with you. Look at it now. He's quoting from Joel chapter 2. And he says in verse 17, It shall come to pass that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show you wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord. Now, I want you to notice something here. He says, it shall come to pass. This is Joel's prophecy now. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Now, that means on every denomination on the face of the earth. Now, some of you belong to denominations that don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You don't believe in the speaking with tongues, but I want you to know you just better get ready. Someone said, well, you know, we don't believe in that tongue talking in our church. Well, you better get used to it because you're going to hear it in your church. I mean, if you come under all flesh, then you're going to have some of it in your church. There's some of you pastors that are saying, well, I hope to God that we don't have that in our church. Well, if Bible prophecy is going to come to pass, you're going to have it in your church, so you better learn about it. You better get into the Word of God and see what it says about it. Because you are going to be faced with it in your church. <laughs> and uh, whether you like it or not, that's what God's Word says. And these are the last days. And I want you to know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues or jumping over the religious walls, breaking down barriers. And I know some of you pastors, you've been having trouble dealing with it already. And you're thinking, dear God, I wish those tongue-talking people would stay out of my church. Well, you may kick them out. Some of have got the left foot of fellowship. Some of you listening to this, you've already gotten the left foot of fellowship. Well, don't get hard at those people because, you see, they've been taught wrong. Pray for them. Pray for them in the Spirit that God will open the eyes of their understanding. Because, you see, these things are going to come to pass in the last days, and we're living in the last days. So just a word to you that say, well, we're not going to have that in our church. Well, you're going to have it in your church. You may not have it in your church like some other people have it in their churches because you're not going to have the great manifestation of it when you don't believe in it. But I want you to know that if the Bible is true, and it must be because all the prophecies that come have been fulfilled up to this time, and I want you to know that it's going to come to pass that you're going to have to deal with it. So you need to begin to study now to find out what the Bible really says about it because it's going to be embarrassing to some of you. It's going to embarrass some of you pastors. It's going to embarrass some of you stiff-necked deacons, you know, that you're so starchy you wouldn't bend over, you'd think you'd break. But I want you to know I'm saying this love now. I'm not saying it to belittle anybody. Learn what the Bible says about it because you're going to be faced with it. Sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with it. Find out what God's Word says about it. You, when you begin to do a study on it, you're going to find out it's for you today. And he says it'll be poured out. God said it'll be poured out upon all flesh. So if you've got flesh in your church, you better get ready because they're going to get the Holy Spirit poured out upon them. 
Now, it's jumping denominal barriers. You've heard about it. Some of you have experienced it. Some of you have heard how the, those people are wrecking churches. No, no, it's tradition. It's tradition that's splitting churches. It's the Word of God that's splitting churches. You see, when people get grounded in tradition, they'll split a church when you break their tradition. And I mean, if they haven't talked in tongues in 49 years and someone comes up speaking in tongues, the Bible experience, sometimes it'll split a church down the middle. Now, don't blame that on the devil. Don't blame it on the devil. It's religious tradition that does that. The Word of God, see, will divide people. God's Word will divide people because some people won't receive the truth. But if you're going to operate in this day, in this hour, when the manifestation of God's power is on the earth, you had better begin to study what God's Word says about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the speaking with other tongues. Now, I give that to you as sound advice by the Spirit of God. See, the anointing of God's on me to say this. And I say it in love, because I know that some of you are in dire problems. You've got more than you can handle. You don't know what to do with it. But I'll tell you, the Spirit of God will teach you what to do with it. It's available to you. The power source I'm talking about, this dynamo, this dunamis power, is available to you after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Well, you see, in the last days, it'll be poured out upon all flesh. Well, it's being poured out upon all flesh today. It's coming. I'll tell you, just get ready for it because it's coming. I mean, you might as well say, well, if I can't fight it out, I'll just have to join them because it's in the Bible. See, I know some of you are saying, well, now, Brother Caps, I know it's in the Bible, but you see, it's not in our doctrine. Well, I mean, your doctrine needs to be changed then if it's in the Bible and it's not in your doctrine. I mean, just study it out. So many people say, well, yes, we're full gospel or we are Bible church. You know, we are a New Testament church. But yet one of the primary things that happened in the New Testament was that they received the Holy Spirit and they went about preaching the Holy Spirit, laying hands on people, getting them healed, getting them filled with the Spirit of God. And they began to talk with other tongues. Yeah, I know it's embarrassing to read that in the Bible. And some of you don't know what to do with it. But it's in there nevertheless. So just begin to study it and see what the Bible says about it. Stay with us in this because we're going to share some things with you in love that will help you understand, it'll open your understanding to this. Because these things are coming. You just mark it down. I mean, just sure as the world is round, these things are going to face you before long if you haven't already been faced with them. So find out what the Bible really says about it for two reasons. For one, you're going to be faced with it and some of you won't know what to do with it if you don't find out what the Bible says about it. Some of you are going to be faced with false tongues, with people that do stir up problems and trouble, and blame it on the Holy Ghost and say that it is the Holy Ghost. Let me say this right now before I go any further. The Holy Ghost does not come into your service and interrupt the service. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman, and he will not intrude, and he will not disrupt services. And I've seen it happen time and time again, and people blamed it on the Holy Ghost. Well, the Holy Ghost made me do that. No, the Holy Ghost didn't make them do that. See, you're going to be faced with the real thing and with the work of the flesh which will disrupt some. And you need to know the difference between the two. Learn how to tell what's real and what's not. And when you find out that there is a real experience, get filled with the Spirit of God. Get the wisdom of God. Let the Holy Spirit reveal it to you. Then I tell you, you'll know how to deal with the thing and you'll recognize the false thing when it comes. You see, some people get caught up in the flesh. And I know that's why people think, well, now, that tongue stuff is of the devil, because they saw someone operated in the flesh. No, when you operate it in the Spirit, it's of God, and it will produce the fruit. Thank God. Go over to Isaiah and see what the prophet of God said. Isaiah chapter 28. Let's read verse 11 and 12. And it said, For with stammering lips and with other tongues will I speak to this people to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Now I want you to notice what the prophet Isaiah said, For with stammering lips and other tongues will I speak to this people. 
yet they would not hear. He said, this is the rest wherewith uh, you may cause the weary to rest. Speaking in tongues is a release in the spirit. Absolutely, it releases in the spirit, and it causes the weariness to depart and to go away. I want to show you a New Testament evidence of that. Let's go to Jude, the book of Jude, verse 20, and let's look at something that Paul said about that. Now, see, the prophet Isaiah said it. He said it forth. But then Paul picked up on it over here, and he makes a statement in two verses here that will help you to understand what he's talking about. In verse 20 of Jude, it says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. In other words, praying in the Holy Ghost are in tongues, are with stammering lips and of other tongues. He said, I will speak unto this people, yet they would not hear me. Well, now, see, we read that in Acts chapter 2, where they were amazed. And he says, Some were mocking, said, These men are full of new wine, see? because they wouldn't hear it. They wouldn't receive it. Well, there's people today that still won't receive it. You see, after all of the generations, and it's in the Bible, I mean, Bible evidence that it was from God. It was sin of God, prophesied even in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament. It's found all throughout the book of Acts and through the New Testament we find that it was a Bible experience, but yet people wouldn't receive it. Now, see here in the 20th verse of Jude, it says, But beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, it didn't say what some people thought it said. Some people thought it said, well, it'll give you more faith if you pray in the Holy Ghost. No, no, it didn't say that. It said it'll build you up in your most holy faith. In other words, the faith you already have, it'll build you up in that faith. In other words, it'll energize you. It'll cause it to become available. It'll energize that faith. It won't give you more faith. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But it'll cause you to utilize the faith you already have. See, some of you didn't realize that, that you may have faith, but it's not doing anything for you. Well, Paul said the way to get it stirred up in you is by praying in the Holy Ghost. Now look at verse 21. Keep yourselves. Well, let's read 20 and 21 together. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ and eternal life. Now he said, keep yourselves in the love of God. Praying in the Holy Ghost will keep you in the love of God. Now, some of you need to get a hold of this because some of you have been having trouble walking in love. You've been having trouble with the flesh. You've just had trouble giving people a piece of your mind. <laughs> you get so stirred up about some things that you just get in the flesh. But if you begin to pray in the Spirit, pray in the Holy Ghost. If you're mad at someone, pray in the Spirit for an hour. Pray in the Spirit for an hour and see if you're still mad at them. I'm convinced that you can't be mad at someone after you pray in the Spirit for an hour. You just can't do it. I don't care how hard you try. It just won't work. Now, some of you that are not filled with the Spirit of God, some of you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You've never spoken with other tongues. Well, you see, here's one of the benefits of it. He says, praying in the Holy Ghost will keep you, it'll build yourself up in your most holy faith. It'll charge you up in the faith that you already have. And it'll keep you in the love of God. Now, notice that the Bible says that faith worketh by love. Now, you see, that would be great benefit to us if we'd get a hold of that and find out that, well, if faith worketh by love, then if I get out of the love walk, then my faith is going to shut down. Now, some of you having a problem right now because your faith is shut down. You've got in strife. You've got in confusion and strife. And it shuts your faith down and you're condemned and the devil's been beating you over the head with all of that condemnation. Well, get a hold of what he says here. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Now, some of you are saying, well, I haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. I can't pray in the Holy Ghost. Oh, yes, you can. Yeah, you can pray in the Holy Ghost. Every believer can pray in the Holy Ghost. Every believer can speak with other tongues. Now, I want you to know it's available to you. You can, it's available to you, and you ought to know that. Now, let's go back to the book of Acts. 
I want you to see that this is a promise to you. I know that some of you have been taught that it went out with the apostles. Some of you have been taught it's not for you today. Some of you have been taught that it's of the devil. But now let's see what the Bible says about it. All right, in the second chapter of Acts, let's look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, see, Peter spoke. Let me say this before we get into that. Peter was a man that was always saying things. He's always putting his foot in his mouth. Someone said if anyone ever needed peppermint-flavored shoes, that, well, Peter did because he always ended up with his foot in his mouth. Well, now, that was true until he was filled with the Spirit of God, until he was in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. But after that, you'll find where Peter never had that problem anymore. He tamed the tongue. The Holy Spirit will help you tame the tongue. See, James said, the tongue is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. No man can tame it. No, you can't tame the tongue. You need to realize that. With your natural ability, you cannot tame the tongue. But the Holy Spirit can tame the tongue. You see, the more you pray in the Spirit, the more you get in the Spirit, the more you'll be able to control the vocabulary that comes out of your mouth. You know, it's pathetic what some people use as a vocabulary. And I tell you, they're speaking doom and doubt and fear and unbelief and curses and all of that. But I tell you, when you get filled with the Spirit of God, it'll change your language. Not only will it change what you're saying, but it'll change you into the spirit realm. And it'll help you in many of these areas. Now, Peter, after the day of Pentecost, or at the day of Pentecost, when he's filled with the Spirit of God, spoke with other tongues, he stood up and preached about three minutes, and 3,000 souls were saved. 3,000 people were added to the church that day. Well, now, that's power. See, he received power after the Holy Ghost had come upon him. Now, you realize that that was not the old man. See, Peter, under the old circumstances, wouldn't have got up and talked that way. But I'll tell you, he got up and preached him a sermon. And when they got through preaching that sermon, this is what I wanted to tie into it here. In verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, heard what Peter preached, he says, They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? I mean, they said, well, well, you've convinced us. I tell you, you've convinced us. What do we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, see, the Holy Spirit's a gift. Now, he said, if you repent and be baptized, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children. Now, I see people that say, well, it's not for us today. Well, I see what Peter said about it. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Not a few that are afar off. All that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, that's who it belongs to. That's who the gift of the Holy Spirit is for. Now, you see, when people say, well, it went out with the apostles. Well, now, you can't find Bible for that. I mean, it's not in the Bible. You can't find it in the Bible. But here he says, the promise of the Holy Spirit, you see, is unto you and to your children. Unto those people and to their children and to them that are far off. Well, I suppose we'd be considered far off from where they were nearly 2,000 years, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Well, you see, people look at that and they, well, no, I won't accept that because of what I've been taught. Well, I want you to know if you've been taught different from what the Bible says, you just need to get a hold of what the Bible said, you see, because Peter said it's for you and for your children, to them and their children, which would include you, to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So, you see, it is for us today, contrary to what some people believe, it belongs to you today. I mean, it is a gift for you. Why would God give it to those people and not give it to us? You see, God's no respecter of persons. So he sent the Holy Spirit. In fact, here's what he said in John chapter 14, you see, verse 12. He says, you shall do greater works than these that I do. He that believeth in me. Now, you see, who's he talking about? He that believeth in me. Are you a believer? 
Just ask yourself, am I a believer? Well, yeah, you're a believer. You've been born of the Spirit of God. If you're born again, then it's available to you. And he said, he that believeth the works that I do shall he do also. Well, someone said, yeah, but I don't believe that's what he meant. Well, you see, you wouldn't be considered a believer in that then. You may be saved. You may be on your way to heaven. But if you don't believe that, then, of course, you're not going to do the greater works. You're not going to enter into the fullness of what God said you can have. And some of you are just in problems now because you're not believing what the Bible said. Oh, yeah, I know some of you pastors and deacons, and some of you just get mad when you hear people talk like I'm talking because you say, well, bless God, who does he think he is? Well, I just think I'm a, a teacher of the Word of God. I'm operating in one of the fivefold ministries, see, teaching the Word of God. Well, get a hold of this because it's available to you. It's to you and to your children. It'll go on eternally. I mean, until Jesus comes, it's available to you. And you can have it today. It is a real Bible experience for today. No, you don't have to wait till you get to heaven or you don't say that it went out with the apostles. Just say, thank God it's for believers and I'm a believer. And in Jesus' name, I'll receive it. But you see, it helps if you believe in the Holy Spirit, because if you don't believe in the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't enter into that. I know that people believe in the Holy Spirit, but sometimes they don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's what we're talking about, the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, look with me to Acts chapter 3, and I believe I'll just share this with you instead of reading it. Let me just share with you. Here's the situation. Peter has come out of the upper room, filled with the Spirit of God, talking in tongues. I mean, filled with the Spirit of God. He preached one sermon there, and 3,000 souls were saved. Now, that's a different man from what he was. You'll have to admit that. Then it says in verse 1 of chapter 3, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the ninth hour to pray. Now, I want you to see this. Here is Peter and here is John going to the temple to pray. And the first cripple man that they come up on after they're filled with the Spirit of God. See, we're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's a man that didn't have the power until he was filled with the Spirit of God. But now, when he walks up to this man, the man expecting to receive an arm, you know, sitting there begging, he never walked a step. He'd been laying there all these years. Might have been there when Jesus was there. But I want you to notice, Peter said to him, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he grabbed him by the hand. Before the old boy knew he couldn't do it, he was leaping and walking and praising God. Well, I see that's the power of the Spirit of God. Now, you realize that Peter did not have that power that no man is going to heal you. No man is going to heal that man. That was the power of the Spirit of God. Did you ever see where Peter did that before he was filled with the Spirit of God? Now, let me just point out some things here about the Spirit of God. You see, Jesus did no miracles until the Holy Ghost came upon him. When he was baptized in the River Jordan, the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove. After that, he began to do the miracles, heal the sick, raise the dead. He cast out demons, and all of those things came about after the Holy Spirit came upon him. Now, you realize he was as much the Son of God before he was baptized as he was after. See, before he was 30 years of age, he was as much the Son of God as he was after he was 30 years of age. But you see, he did no miracles until the Holy Ghost came upon him. Now, here in the New Testament, you find that Peter, filled with the Spirit of God, and John with him, spoke to a man. Peter spoke to that man and said, I don't have any silver or gold with me, but he said, such as I have, I give you. And in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk, grabbed him by the hand, and lifted him up. Well, now, I think you realize he couldn't have lifted that man up unless the man's bones received strength and his ankles received strength because you just couldn't lift a man up by his hand. Well, it was the power of God that flowed out of him. You see, power, dunamis, dunamis, it says. You shall receive dynamite or a dynamo after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Well, you see it here in operation in his life. It's available to you today. No, it didn't go out with the apostles. These things are still available to you. Now, you see, this got them in a whole lot of trouble because of that, because the man leaped and walked. 
See, they all came running together, Solomon's porch, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? And why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? Well, you see, he's telling them, it's not our power. No, he said, you've denied the Holy One. And he said, it's through that name that the man was made whole. Yeah, it's through his name. Now, go on over to chapter 4. See, we're going to have to hurry to get through with this. Chapter 4, verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, see, they got them on trial now. And they asked them, by what power or by what name have you done this? How did you? There was a great miracle. They couldn't deny it. There was no way they could deny it. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he was made whole, be it known unto you all. I mean, he said, let all of you know this, that to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'll tell you, look at verse 13. This is exciting. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Well, I want you to know that they commanded them not to do that and sent them away, told them not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. Well, they didn't want them to spread that. Praise the Lord. But I'll tell you, it spread anyway. We're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. See, the power that was in Peter's life. Now, you see, that's not the only one. Somebody said, yes, but you see, Peter was an apostle. Well, it was not just for an apostle. I want you to know that. It wasn't just for apostles. In fact, if you look in the sixth chapter, you'll find out that it says that they had chosen seven men to be servers of tables, just serving tables. And one of these men was Stephen. Stephen and Philip. Philip and Stephen both were the ones that they had for serving tables. And it says that Stephen then began to do great and mighty miracles. Look at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now, here's a man waiting on tables. He's not a preacher. He's not an apostle. He's a layman, and here he is doing great wonders and miracles. It says, the Bible says that Stephen was full of faith and power. Well, where did that power come from? By the Holy Spirit. Verse 10 says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. He spoke by the Holy Spirit of God. See, we're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit that's available in your life. Some of you are wondering, well, how in the world could I tap into this? By the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is how these men tapped into it. It didn't happen until they were filled with the Spirit of God, until they spoke with tongues. You see, this is the power force that comes by the Holy Spirit. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Someone said, well, I don't have power. Well, you haven't received the power of the Holy Spirit then. You haven't received the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. Now, I realize you could be filled with the Spirit of God, speak with other tongues, and not operate in that power. Many people do. But I want you to know also that it's available to you, and it's available to you today. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven to tap this power. Now, you see, he preached by the power of God and by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They stoned him to death, and he stood there and prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. Now, in the eighth chapter of Acts, we find another example. Verse 5 said, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now, here's a man that was ordained to wait on tables. He's just a waiter of tables, but he went down there and preached Christ to him. Now, see, he's not an apostle. He's not one that God has just specifically anointed to do something like that. He's just a layman. He went down there and preached Christ to him, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. 
For unclean spirits, crying out with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsy, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Well, you see, Philip now, a man that was not ordained as an apostle, he was just waiting on tables. He's down there preaching Christ in the power of the Spirit of God. Stephen here, there was great revival in this city. Then the Spirit of God spoke to Philip, told him, said, you leave here and go on down there because he said there's a man you need to talk to. And he went out there in the desert. The Holy Spirit sent him out in the desert. I mean, all the miracles that happened sent him in the desert. Well, he followed the leading of the Spirit of God and found the Ethiopian eunuch that he spoke to and revealed the Word of God to him and got the man saved. And I'll tell you, it changed the continent because he was obedient to the Spirit of God. And I want you to know when you become obedient to the Spirit of God, to the Word of God, you're going to change some lives around you.